Good evening and welcome to the Selling Art podcast brought to you by Frequency House from the Dylan Thomas birthplace in the uplands in Swansea. Uh, as with me, as usual, is Simon Howard Jones. Good evening, Simon. Good evening, Iqbal. How are you? I'm very well, mate. You right? How are you doing after the weekend? Um, spread myself too thin with yeah. the fringe, to be honest, and that's no criticism of Joe. I just signed up to do too much because we were in the Brangman Hall on Thursday night. So I was rehearsing on Friday, and there was a gig on Saturday. And was it was a good day. gig, mate. Uh, but joining us this week is a uh, poet and author, um, former versifier in residence at the Dylan Thomas birthplace, Natalie Ann Holborough. Evening. Evening. How are we doing? I'm all right. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> not too bad. How does it feel being back up at the birthplace? It's always lovely coming back. Like the atmosphere doesn't change at all. Yeah, he's done. I mean, Jeff's done a good job up here, hasn't he? Hmm. It's um, it's the old decor, isn't it? It just sort of hits you. Yeah. But, but I mean, how, so how long were you doing that for then, that? Because... Um, uh, I think it was about a year and a half. It was while I was doing my master's. Right, yeah. okay. And what, so how long ago would that have been? 2014, I think. 2014, yeah. right, okay. Because I'm, I'm just trying to work out when I started my sort of residency. I think it would have been last year, isn't it? It's been about a year, um, isn't it? It's about a year, mm. yeah. Um, so the podcast is kind of one of the things that we're doing, um, but we're here to talk about um, your book and your projects and all the rest of it. Um, so you released your book mm-hmm. uh, and suddenly you find yourself in 2017, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so how have you found that process? Uh, completely unexpected, because when you're younger and you're imagining being a writer and you're imagining publishing your book, you think it's just going to be like a fairy tale sort of thing but then there was so many ups and downs like you finish the book but then that's the easy part in a way you get that relief when you've come to the last page but then there's the editing process which is really difficult um but you forget as well how much other people can help you with your work um because i find that with school you sort of like you're taught to just write your stories and submit them as they are um and i've Got, as I've become older, I've started sending my work out to other people and trusted friends or writer circles before I actually send them out to publishers. Um, so what I actually finished writing and what actually got published are two almost different things. Just because you've got that time to reflect, you've got other people's inputs and you're seeing how other people read what you've written. Mm. Um, and then there's the actual publishing bit. Like I was on a complete high when I launched it. And then you're going out and you're doing all these readings. And then it's suddenly like all of that energy that you've put into the book is suddenly gone from you and you don't know what to do and you're at a loss and you do feel quite down after. And I did write a blog post about this, about this part that no one ever tells you about, that what you do after it, that that sense. Yeah. It's almost like a heartbreak. What's the blog post then? I mean, are, 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 are listeners able to find that and kind of source it out? Yeah, that's um, girlmaddersbirds.wordpress.com. Um so I should really update it with another post soon. I've uh, been slacking on that a little bit. Um, yeah, you've got a lot of projects on there, <laughs> I've got a lot of can't projects. Do everything. Uh, yeah, I try and write about different different things that just come up in writing. Um, like, for example, my last post was about the 100 rejections um, challenge that some people are doing this year. Right, okay. Um, I was a bit on the fence about that one at first because I just think... For me, it's about 100 submissions, not 100 rejections. Because I think if you just go in to fail all the time, you're not actually trying your best. Right, okay. I think I overheard a conversation about this. Mm. Because you were on um, another podcast, The Crunch uh, yeah. Poetry Podcast, um, in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, our mutual friends, um, Adam Silman, Reese Owen Williams and Richard James Jones do that, don't they? That's right. And yeah. I'm sure you're having a conversation around that. Did... did did Reese bring that up? I think um, he might have mentioned something around, um, he'd read an article, wasn't it? And it's like, well, you've got to aim for a certain amount of um, submissions. Yeah, should, that's you right. Know, should we say a year? Yeah. And he was talking about turning it into a bit of a game, wasn't it? That, um, mm. you know, you kind of collect these um, rejection slips, but inevitably in the process. Mm. I mean, is, is it around that? You, that you it's know, so it came up again. It came up last year and then, or this year, and it, became this hashtag 100 rejections and people were celebrating all the rejections. And there was just something about it where I noticed people were just sending things out unedited for the sake of getting rejected. And I was just going, there's something not right in that process. You should still take some sort of 
pride in your work still sort of step back and still go back to it and do that editing process as well before you submit and I think it's all well and good taking rejection well but there's also that you can't overlook the process of editing. If something gets rejected, perhaps it wasn't to that editor's taste, but there's also, oh, could I rework this in a way or is there something I need to revisit? Do you feel like it was devaluing the whole process? Yeah, in a way, because it is hard work getting published, but mm. I, I don't know, something just didn't sit right with me. Shit posting for poets. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, shit posting is just an internet term for cocking about, but, right. but... I mean, did you see some of the sort of submissions? I mean, were you having... Did you sort of, I mean, did you have any, I don't know, experience of some of the things that people were sending? Were they on purpose sending God awful things in? No, it's not that things were awful. It was more that people were very reluctant to take advice. And I think that's such an important thing as a writer. You take critical feedback on board. If it's just criticism, that's a totally different thing from constructive criticism from another writer or another reader because that's something valuable you should collect those things okay they might sting a little bit first but there's something about it that's telling you okay someone's not getting the point of what I'm trying to say here is there another way I could word it or um is there a line I could edit out do I need to look at it again rather than just going right that person doesn't like it I'm just going to keep sending it out sending it out because you're never going to grow yeah it's quite an interesting one the self-editing thing before you submit stuff um i'm pretty sure i saw like a panel i think it might have been at last year's fringe with Susie wilde and a few other people talking that's about, right the publisher one that's yes yeah. yeah exactly and she was saying that and i think there was another panel member i can't remember who it was um had a different approach to hers like i think, I think Susie wilde was talking about having quite a, a heavy hand in the editing process mm -hmm. As an editor, yeah. For um, is she Parthian as well? I'm guessing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other girl, I can't remember her name, um, was saying that she takes an opposite view, sort of quite a light touch to it. Mm -hmm. um, have you got an opinion on that? Into in, in terms of what what's best? I mean, is there a best? I mean, or is it just um, kind of editor, editing again? It's subjective. So editors are never going to force you to change anything. And Susie is my editor for my next book, and I think she's a great editor. Um, but again, you can. It's just advice, and what you need to do with that is take what you will from it. You don't have to change your work. If you, you know, really want to stand by something and you know exactly what point you're making, stay with it, don't change it. But if they've you know, taken the time to say, okay, maybe you could revisit this or this is what I've got from this line, think about it as well before you go submitting again. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever felt so passionately about something that um, it's sort of rubbed up against what you've just been talking about you had uh, to make a stand it's more been in hindsight i think when i started sending work out, i was so pleased to get it published that um i was happy to go with the edits um this was in like past journals when i first started writing and now looking back i've realized this whole stanza's has chopped off the end and it's not my poem anymore or it's mm. been too heavy-handed and I don't recognise the work. It's not my style anymore. So who is this that's publishing these things and taking away whole stanzas at the end? Um, I don't want to name Oh, no, that's shame. fine, that's <laughs> fine. But there, there, are, there are, let's just for argument's sake say, there are some ways of approaching something as delicate as the written word mm -hmm. where you don't eviscerate it. And yeah. um, that's kind of what some... Some people kind of do. They don't appreciate the... I wonder why that is. Um, do you reckon it's just a case of getting the words on the page, getting it to fit? Or, I mean, we've had a conversation. It hardly seems that what you'd be writing, and I have no prior knowledge of what you've been writing, and that's not being disrespectful mm -hmm. it's at all. Um, this is like a whole sort of process for me because I'm just a dumb musician. Um, that I'd hardly get that anything that you had been writing would have been quite inflammatory or anything like that. So I'm oh, sort no, of surprised. It wasn't that it was inflammatory. It was mm. more that uh, I, don't, I think she just didn't like the, the conclusion at the end. She wanted to leave it on a cliffhanger, whereas I wanted that conclusion. That's the mm. way I used to write a lot more. I like to tie it, mm. tie it together. Um, maybe not so much now, but when I look back, it's, it's, miss, it's missing the emotion of that last bit and it's, it's not my poem anymore. I have another question about that. Um, do you ever reach a point once performing a poem or said poems, collected works, where after it's been said so much, it loses all of its 
impact to yourself it no longer has a relevance oh god yeah mm. like there's there's certain poems where i do them they go down really well as readings but i'm almost embarrassed reading them because mm. i just think there's people in the audience who hear this over and over and over and i might still perform them but there's something a little bit awkward about it just because i've heard it so much i forget sometimes that this might be the first time to someone else so you've just got to try and get over that a little bit yeah, I mean, I've got to be honest, for me, the editing process has been quite a, well, it's been a bit of a learning curve, really, um, because I found that two people in particular in my life were editing my poems um, on a sort of personal level. Uh, you're smiling, Simon. Uh, no, because the way you, you know said, no, 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 you no, know it's because the way you said that, it was like, it's like the sort of ramblings of a madman. So I woke up in the morning and yeah. she'd cut out whole sections. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I'm ha probably half mad in fairness, um, not diagnosed, um, but, um, that's well, no, 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 hey, go on. You no, can't, that's a, that's a bombshell and a half to come out with what? to go and say there was people, what, so, were there people who were being detrimental to your work? No, not detrimental at all. Um, I, I basically found two people who I could trust with the editing process. Right. So one of them was a friend who, um, I've known, oh God, he, he's about 10 years older. And Is that the him. lad from, we had a chat outside your house about yeah. from, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really cool guy. Um, yeah, Really, really nice fella. Um, so he, his name's Steve Payne. So he was helping me sort of do the editing process and he'd take it away. And he's not a poet, but he, but he's a writer. Um, and I was finding that he was really considerate about it. He'd take it away and he'd spend like the best part of a week, just kind of looking at one poem. So like, constructive. Really yeah. constructive, yeah. And just be, be sort of pointing out particular words or a line or two, which perhaps didn't fit. Um, and the other person I found really helpful, Natalie, I think you probably know him, Alan Perry. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I was, you know, kind of corresponding with Alan for years. Um, he's still around, superb poet, mm. excellent poet. Um, and um, he was really helpful. You know, he'd be saying... Much like you, you know, you're saying, well, perhaps take out the bottom verse or the last verse. I remember one particular poem, Self-Portrait of the Blue Boar, which was in, in Hay on Why. And there were just two small verses in the middle of that poem, which he said, look, that stands as it is. I mean, that's the poem. All the other stuff you're writing in, in that piece didn't really fit. Um, so it is nice to have someone you can rely on, I think, really. Um, I mean, do you have people like that, like sort of friends that you will sort of yeah, get yeah, people to have, have sort of once over? I, I totally agree with you on that. You should have a network of support like that. And um, we started meeting up uh, myself, Risa and Williams, Emily, who you had on yeah. last week, um, Adam Silman, Mary Ellis and Alan Kellerman. We all sort of meet, say, once a month and we'll pick a poetry book. And it's just a way of getting us to read more widely from like each other's. That's a great idea. Each other's reading yeah. lists. Um <laughs> But also if we've got works in progress, we pop them into a shared folder and then get feedback on it. And you know, some of us have gone on to get that sort of work published and perhaps we wouldn't have edited that in the way we would have done if we hadn't shown people first. Christ, that's a trust exercise and a half. I imagine yeah. it, it, that's... <laughs> you have to have people you trust. Yeah, I can imagine. Because there's, there's me, like, okay, no offence to Chris, who isn't with us tonight, right? So like, okay... Um, not a poet, musician, and lyrics do sort of interweave, I suppose, a little bit. But there are some things I would never share. Yeah, but you've the got your band, but you've got your band mate. I, I think that even with the band, even really? with the band. Oh god, mm. yeah. Oh god. It, it, I thought bands were more more into you know sort of sharing bits of work and going no that doesn't work. No, work. no, it's one of the. I'm I'm immensely conflicted about being a musician because the amount of egos that go on in play it's it's bottom line is you're lucky if you're in a band with people you get on with that's sometimes more important than the actual technical ability of the people you're with because there's nothing more irritating than egos for musicians or rock stars in waiting and if you're bringing something to the table as it were which is quite you know you've struggled with it you've labored with it it can be unforgiving. It really can be, especially in the sort of genres I've played in. Um, and that's why it's, I always find it really difficult to sort of play in some of the genres I've played in. But you've been in quite a few bands though as well, haven't you? It's not about years. me, let's not, I'm just sort of No, saying, no, no. I mean, but um, I think, oh, no, I wouldn't say you were no, a common I, denominator. No, no, uh, I know, but it's you know, not being able to but... Um, yeah, but I think it's quite a nice crossover though, mm. you know, the sort of music and the poetry 
sort of field. And um, I think there's a natural, you know, kind of crossover, frankly. Um, the writing process, the kind of construction of a piece. Yeah, but you guys, I envy you guys because it's just your head and a pen and a paper and you're off. You know but what there's I mean? also, I agree with Iqbal and there is a musicality to it. And I, I remember when you used to come to the Madders Birds Nights, you used to read and you'd have music behind it and it totally changes it. Yeah. And, you have, and it makes you recognise that when you're writing, you do have a rhythm in your head and the words do have to sort of flow in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, actually, now you've mentioned Mad as Birds, that, mm. was, that was a nice little supportive um, yeah. group in the Uplands, wasn't it? Um, which cafe was that in? I've forgotten the name. That was, it's, it was Steam Cafe, then it was Squirrel Cafe. Ah, that's it? right. Yeah. Yeah. But again, you've all got this sort of support. When, when it comes to musicians, the knives are out. It's a very different... And I've noticed when we talked about and met some of your... You know, poetry, I don't know, clicks the wrong word, but entourage, I don't know, entourage is the wrong word as well, but poetry gang is a gang. Yeah. Um, bands and musicians aren't like that. They really aren't like that. It's very rare. That a bit more find- sniping. Massive snipers, yeah. in the words of My the rusty nuts. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was a word we uh, that's what sort of I like picked up on. Well, not, not your songs, but um, no, but you know, I think the thing with the um, I tell you who isn't guilty of that is Tom Emlyn. Uh, hands oh, down. He's a folk singer, isn't he? Yeah, Tom, Tom gets it. Tom's kind of like on another. He's spinning on another plateau, as it were. He's kind of above so it. So why do you say that. he gets it then? What's What's different about Tom Emlyn? Because Tom comes to it where he's so preoccupied with what he's doing, he doesn't actually give a shit about what anybody else is doing, which is really refreshing. So when you get a piece of criticism or acceptance from someone like Tom, it's from a genuine place. It's not from the oh man. Yeah. I know of some bands who I won't mention who have rung up the support band of a headliner who've been, say, one or two down and complained that they should be further up. And it's like, you know, stupid, ah, right. inane stuff. That, but I mean, a lot of that's ego, isn't it? Yeah, I hate it's it. It's ego and pride, mate. But that's why I kind of like the whole poetry thing because you guys, yeah. obviously, as you've said, you I'm meet, so you know, glad I'm a poet. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. Um, no, quite right. And you know what? Swansea's got a massive swell of kind of poets. I mean, uh, you know, just kind of hanging around in those circles for a while, you, you sort of realise how many of us there are. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite, it is quite weird. We are legion. We are Crawling legion. with them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but like, for, for, you know, for instance, there's, you know, um, a lot of poetry open mic nights. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you can find two or three a month that you can actually go to. But Wales is very much like that as well. Yeah. Like, you know, Cardiff poets and then there's the North mm. Wales poets and there's a lot of spoken word artists there. Mm. It's it's getting out of that little bubble of Wales yeah. that's difficult. But it, yeah. we do have a really good support network as well. Yeah. Have you been out of Wales much to kind of um, test your um, kind of poetry to a different ear that is um, not Swansea-based, not Welsh-based? I did bring my stuff to Dublin one, one, uh, one year and... I don't know. I just I just chickened out because they were all musicians and there were there's very little poetry and I just didn't do it. I can imagine that. I can I can I can imagine what that was like. Mm, it was just it was too intimidating. Yeah, I, I, as I much know. as I love Dublin. No, yeah. I that's what I'm referring to. Nothing but fedoras and flat brim hats and uh, yeah, used to hipsters. Scum of the earth. Are oh, you going to give the hipsters a kick? I hate them. But I, was in Bris- I was in Bristol when hipsters ki- I, I was in Bristol when hipsters became a you thing. You were there when it began. I was there when, when it began. began. It was all fine. And then one day they came in. Where did they come from? They came up. We didn't know. It was on Felton. <laughs> they came all the way up from Frenchie eh, along Felton. And before you knew it, they were at pop-up shops all along Gloucester Road. It was a nightmare. But so, yeah. I mean, so how do you find the music scene in Swansea? Then? I, mean, I mean, do you think it is, it's, it's got its uniqueness as well? Yeah, there's some very good people down here. That's the thing. The good people down here, I wouldn't trade for the world. And they're very supportive. What I like about it down here is that there are open mics going on all the time. And there are people who actually go to it who are in their 50s, 60s, and even 70s, and they're still playing. And they're not chasing it for the fame aspect of it. They're chasing it because they love it. Yeah. It's the self-development, which is the th- it's the, the real aspect that's why i said on previous podcasts i like poetry because it feels like it's untainted it's a, it's a what's the word it's an industry within itself and you get published and that's all fantastic and you can recoup a revenue and have a life and be recognized blah 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 xyz music's really heavily tainted 
where if you start out with the best intentions, there's always, oh yeah, and we'll be living by the pool by March, boys, and we'll be in, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's head in the bollocks. cloud stuff a little bit, isn't it? It's hedonistic bollocks, and yeah. I, that's not how I am. We so. just we just glamorise, you know, being piss poor, sitting there with a <laughs> cigarette, just sort of like begging for money to go into Noah's. Yeah, but there is something. I like quite like that. Image. Yeah, there is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but there is something quite. There is something quite. What's the word? Nice about it, and nice is too precise as my old English. I think it's quite authentic, me. isn't it? Yes, I mean, that's you know, it, authentic. Uh, I think the the oh, don't get me wrong. I've heard some god awful poetry. Yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, not in Swansea in yeah. in Bristol. Was that an official review of my book? Oh. No, I've never read your book. <laughs> oh. I can't oh. read. I'm illiterate. Um, no, but I, no, I did want to actually lend that book to you before we came tonight. But um, I, uh, it's, it's, is, as it was because you were worried because I've still got Howard Ingham's and I'm. Well, or I might leave it on a bus. I mean, I can't be, I can't be trusting you with books until I get Howard Ingham's book back. Um, so I need to have a little look at that one. What I'm curious about, though, is, I mean, I don't know. I had a mind fart then. Oh dear. <laughs> no, 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 it's, oh, it's old age. It's old well, age. As long as it was only a mind fart, it was a mind and fart. Not another. Um, okay, so <laughs> get it. Keep that in. We'll right. keep it in. Whatever. Yeah, might as well. Um, okay, but um, back to the Dublin thing. Mm -hmm. is, is that the only place you've taken your book? Because I, I, I know you haven't. I know you've no, gone elsewhere um, as well. Kind of skipped a bit. Well, well, gone over and done readings in Sweden and India. But like, as for the UK, I, I need to do more. And I think when the next book comes out next year, I will be doing a lot more around the UK. Yeah. I'd, I'd really like to go go and do a reading in London. Well, that's massive. I mean, that's a pretty pretty big bombshell drop i've done readings in sweden yeah, and like india the, yeah yeah it's like, off can like we a, go back to that no one recognizes me that how time. did you get to india don't say on a plane no no, no. I did. <laughs> do the sweden thing first okay so how in the name of uh jesus harold christ did you end up in sweden reading poetry just drunk one night and got on a plane. Are you I? kidding? It was that spontaneous. No, I I applied for this uh, this Dylan Thomas residency. Right. Um, and it was to go and celebrate his work out there, and just sort of introduce it to this little com community um, in Sweden, uh, this tiny little town called Tranas, and it's it's really really sweet there, and they're all. So they hadn't had much experience of poetry nights, so we sort of took our open mic nights out there, and even now I think that was back in. That was the start of 2014, and they still do it in this Thai restaurant every single week. They've got this. So you kickstarted a revolution. Open mic night. Yeah, they, they do poetry, and they've like Anthony Jones, um, one of the Carmarthen poets. Um, he was a good friend of mine, and they actually have a fe like a festival out there. And they celebrate him, and he became like the poet of Tranus. Good God, right? Yeah. Okay, he's become their idol. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay, so that's how you got to Sweden. No, no, wait, wait. No, no, I want to know about India. This is this well, is. Well, I was just uh, just about Sweden. I okay. thought this was a Dominic Williams thing. It is, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. So it, was, so, so it was part of Write for Word and Coracle, which are his organisations right, okay. as well. Um, but it, that year it was the Dylan Thomas residency, and I thought because I was doing oh, I see. Right, doing okay. the residency here as well, I thought it was a perfect yeah. time to go. Because Dom is great. I mean, he he's is. very supportive. I find hmm. of, of the whole poetry kind of thing. Um, but yeah, okay, so go back to your India thing then, Simon. Yeah, Where because not even that? Alexander the Great got to India. So you got to India. Yeah. What happened? How did you get there? Oh God, it was it was quite short notice. Right. Um, so it was sort of, um, I had a phone call from my publisher. Uh, Do you want to go to India? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so next thing, um, we're just going to Calcutta and we just travelled, arrived in Delhi and then went off to Varanasi, which is probably my favourite place ever. Um, and then Calcutta, and then we went up to sort of where Buddha gave his first sermon. And it was mm. the project was Va City Valley City Village, I think it was in mm. that order. But anyway, that was we just wanted to see different parts, and you'd get on the train, get out somewhere else, and it was almost like you'd arrived in a different country, just because everywhere was so different around there. Did you right? So coming from a Western perspective, mm -hmm. going over to India, yeah. were there any things that sort of you had to talk with your publisher about that, okay, culturally speaking, this mm -hmm. is at cross purposes with certain beliefs or was there yeah. anything like that you had to be sort of wary of? Um, you don't have to go into exact no, detail. I but... think um, it was more, I was more careful about the poems I was reading. Like I, we did it at Calcutta Book Festival, which is like the second largest in the this world. This was the International was, Book Festival. That was it, it yeah. yeah. It, was, it was massive. But obviously there were certain poems I wouldn't have felt comfortable reading because I didn't know how the audience would take it. Mm. Um, but to be honest, they, 
it's it surprised me. Mm. Like they they're really they're so passionate about about books and yeah, poetry. There's one thing I do want to ask. Okay, right. So from a female perspective, mm-hmm. Dylan Thomas. Yeah. Right, because I find him. And this is, I've said this on previous. You're saying podcasts. this in his house now. Yeah, I know He'll it's kick fine. You out. No, pff, what's he going to do? He's dead. Um, <laughs> my point is this: I've I've always found it very difficult. Um, with some of the way he carried on okay and i'm not just saying that because i'm sat across from a woman I, i've said this to you on previous mm. podcasts because mm. i'm not saying i'm a square well it's been a radio really, four there's been some really good conversations about his but, lifestyle et cetera, yeah et cetera, it's et it's yeah. like some of it i'm like ah, dude you just I, I, it's it's very difficult how does it sit with you you know some of the more salacious things the the sort of the behavior that's like oh As god a poet though i i kind of want to I did. Like, I think unless you know someone on a personal level, you can't just judge what you're reading. The more I get involved with projects about poets, mm. the less I'm just going to judge what what people mm. are writing about them. For example, mm. I'm doing a project now on Christine Keeler, and she is absolutely slated by the media. Why is she she's slated called, by the media? She's called a prostitute. She's it's it's almost like a class issue. That's what that's the perspective we're taking from it now. We're like we're just going from okay, she was from a lower class but she's always been called a prostitute. She mm. never got out of that. And it was the others who then came out of it unscathed. Mm. Um, so it's about going back and this project is about giving her a voice and we're writing poetry for mm. her and the person that she was. Mm. And the, like, I, she did write autobiographies, but then everyone just goes by what they write in the newspapers. Was she? Why would I know that name? Because that name does ring a bell. It's not the Profumo big, affair, is it? That's it. Yeah, yes, there's a okay. big project going on at the moment. It's it's just stopped in Swansea. Mm. So there's an exhibition at the Eliz- Elysium Gallery, mm. and there's going to be a poetry night there on the nineteenth. Mm. Um, so I'm involved with that. But going back to Dylan Thomas, um, I love him for his work, mm. and there is there's so much debate around his lifestyle. How can I possibly take any sort of opinion about it? So now, just going back to your um, book for a minute, if you don't mm-hmm. mind. Um, so I was having another look um, through it, and there's a lot of different themes, yeah. obviously. But um, one thing that did strike me was um, uh, the influence of the Greek kind of mythology and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, did that happen naturally, or was that something that you sort of deliberately wanted to weave in, or was that something that is... Um, close to your heart, that whole kind of period of time and the and the mythological stuff. Uh, that turned out I actually preferred that subject at A level than I did English literature, which was a surprise because I'd originally applied to go to medical school and missed out by one grade, and so I went back and did classics because it just looked interesting. And then just the Greek myths, they just ended up inspiring me so much, and it was so closely tied with literature um, that I just absolutely fell in love with it and these characters and the way that you could give them voices in like ways that they hadn't been told before. And I became obsessed with doing that, especially the female characters, because I just wanted to make them really strong. Yeah. Because there were a couple of poems um, that I thought were really, really nicely crafted poems. Um, Medea mm-hmm. uh, is one. Was it Penelope okay. was the other? Um, there's a couple of others. They'll sort of come back to me as we're talking. But... Um, I mean, how do you sort of use those influences to kind of shape a poem? I mean, what's the process with that? Um, I think a lot of it, it comes from my college essays and it's almost like women are either, they're either victims or they are monsters. There's not really an in-between or they're just erased because you've got Penelope and she sort of sits and waits patiently. She's faithful but there's no sort of... She hasn't really got a voice, has she? She's not... You can't really define her in the way you could define Achilles. Um, but I just wanted to imagine her in the modern day and just think, would she Would she really sit by the window that whole time? <laughs> and she probably wouldn't. How long was it? I can't remember. It was a so bloody long time. It was a, a bloody long time. Uh, true. So Penelope, if I'm right, was the wife of Odysseus, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Who travelled, and hence Homer's Odyssey. That was mm-hmm. about his kind of... Uh, you know, sort of whole experience, but yeah. well, he's um, a bit of a, of a lad, you know. He just sleeps with all these sirens, you know. Yeah. Goes off and has a laugh. I didn't realize he slept with the sirens. I thought they put wax in their ears to prevent them from oh. crashing into the rocks. He would have done. He would have done. <laughs> did he or didn't did he? he, then? Yeah, did I, he I, I feel like that. I, I, I thought. I thought that they they bound into the mast, 
and he bore all of the sound um, and then he made all the crew. Yeah, he didn't He didn't sleep with them, but you know, he's got this sort of like... But they were half bird, I can't imagine, that, like half winged He's thing. almost like a Casanova type character, isn't it? And you just sort of <laughs> laugh at him, whereas she's Nando's always... is open, ladies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? She's she's just, you know, she she's expected to wait. Ah, oh, right. So it's, the, it, it's ah. Okay. There's no question that okay. she would have gone off to anyone else. Whereas with him, yeah, he would have done. Well, I'm, I, I think part of that story, she was being courted by various suitors, wasn't she? Sort of continuously, sort mm. of. Um, but she was faithful to yeah. his return, wasn't it? So I just mm. imagine, well, what if she'd just gone for it? Yeah. 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 To hell with it. And she should have. Frankly, mm. let's be honest. Who would wait like that long? How long time? did she wait for Odysseus? I feel like it was like 10 years plus, but I can't... Yeah, it was I, years. Yeah. I can't remember how many years. Yeah, I'm not that much of an expert on the, that particular field, unfortunately. I did it for GCSE, classical civilization, but it was more from the archaeological point of view, and obviously it ties in, and then you change one pantheon to another pantheon from the Greek to the Roman. But, um, you know, my knowledge is quite patchy on it. And again, those stories never used to sit with me. So Zeus turned himself into a bull and he did what? Oh, okay. Well, that sounds great. I'm just going to write that down in my book. Um, but Norse mythology sort of that, that interests me more than, and that's not to be disrespectful. It's just to sort of say that the Norse side of things interests me a little bit more than the Greek um, and I do agree with you on that respect, um, because, you know, the Gorgon, it is, it is pretty, um, it is pretty strong and yeah, it's, so, I mean, f from your experience from the classics, women are either port portrayed as sort of almost, you know, sitting there and pining away. As yeah, and if they're not, they're monsters. The, well, because... sirens and g the Gorgon, as we've just Yeah, stated. also Medea, she's monstrous, and what is monstrous about her is not the fact that she... It's not the act of murder with her children, it's the fact that she's gone against her maternal instinct. That's what horrifies people. Mm. And she's, she's not a human, she's a witch, which to them then was a monster. She's not even a woman. So it almost mm. dehumanises her. Mm. Have there been any cultures where there has been a better representation of women in the classics, to your knowledge? Is there? I'm not sort of mm. saying there's an exemplar, but is yeah. there? Is there? I'm not familiar with a lot of. I thought mm. there's, you know, Greek and Roman, mm. but they're closely tied, mm. so I I don't really know. That would be interesting, because mm. we venerate Bodicea, and I know it's not the um, I know it's not classics and it's the ancients, but you know we, the British do have you know the Boudicca and whatnot, the, the warrior princess, mm. and whatnot. Then obviously later there's Joan of Arc to the French, which is a very interesting thing if you've ever been to Rouen. Um, being we went there when I was in school, and they really don't like the English. They really don't like the English in Rouen um, because they have this whole thing. Uh, a vignette uh, to Joan of Arc and the British mannequin when they're setting, setting fire to her. It's the most ugliest, fattest looking <laughs> English uh, crusader or soldier you've ever seen. I think um, it's quite it's quite important to travel though as well, isn't it? To kind of get out and um, sort of see some of these places. I mean, I was wondering whether you'd actually been to Greece, for instance, whether that's yeah, something... Yeah, I've been to Greece. I looked yeah. around temples and ancient places and got food poisoning outside a temple. Jesus Christ. Great. Where but did you aside travel? Aside from that... I mean, whereabouts do you travel? Was it mainland or was it kind of islands or...? Um, where was that? I'm trying to think. I can't remember the, na the name of the exact place I went. It was I'm a while ago. I'm assuming you were mainland Greece rather yeah, than... Yeah, it was mainland Greece. Right, okay, okay. I mean, it's an amazing country to go to. I mean, I've travelled there fairly extensively. There is good and, uh, food. Yeah. Stuffed vine leaves are incredible. Sell me to Athens. I'd like to go there. Just the stuffed vine leaves or... Have um, you ever you had... partake in anything else? I've never been to Greece. I haven't been out of the UK since 1992. Right. I'm a little England. I uh, know. Um, what I was going to say is that... Have you ever had stuffed vine leaves? Like yeah. proper... Oh, the Dolmades, I think you'll actually Ooh. find that as pronounced. But well done. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 
so yeah, sorry. So we've in, we keep interrupting that, can we not? Um, yeah, you're quite right. We are interrupting. We're hijacking. That. We, we we are quite right. Um, let's get back to something I, again. I'm uh, quite keen to ask you about that. Um, so you did your creative writing degree in Swansea Uni, didn't you? Yes. And one of your tutors or lecturers was Nigel Jenkins. Yeah. Um, I'd met him a few times. He'd actually been down to Howell okay, um, yeah. in Mozart's a few times, and he was encouraging students to kind of go mm. there. Um, but he's a very well-regarded poet, isn't he? He is, yeah. Um, I didn't really know him personally, if I'm honest, but um, I do like his poetry. I mean, how did you find him as a as a as a, as a lecturer or professor or whatever? You've got certain people who just sort of go above and beyond their jobs, don't they? And you know they're passionate right, about right. what they do. But he he'd go to every student and he'd make you feel like you were the most important person and that your work really mattered like mm. he didn't just you just weren't a lot of numbers and marks on the page he wanted to know you he wanted to know your ambitions mm. and he'd help you towards those goals and I remember in my I think it was my second year I was going through a really tough time and I was seriously thinking of packing uni in and I went to talk to him and said look I'm gonna drop out of uni and he just he just sat me down and he talked about you know, why I wanted to be a writer encouraged me to you know carry on trying with it um, keep doing what I did and I swear if it wasn't for him sitting me down hmm. and giving me that talk I wouldn't have stuck with uni so at what point of your studies was that then was it earlier on or was it um, sort of... it was in the middle I think it was right. my second year and I just I just had all this self-doubt I just felt like everyone was cleverer than me or more talented than me and I just I so it was know. it was a lack of confidence at that it point. It was then. completely. So, yeah. so it wasn't because you weren't submitting hmm. stuff. It was just sort of self questioning as to whether you were a kind of valid student yeah. compared to other people. Because university is a strange kind of experience in many respects, isn't it? I fucking hated it. Did you? I, I loved fucking it. hated it. I hated every minute of Where it. Where did you go? Uh, were you Plymouth? Oh, right. The, well, the mouth. The mouth. I thought that's why you were talking to Howard Ingham about it. No, I live with a load of guys from Plymouth, the mouth. Ah, right. And I went to I Plymouth, see. and that's where I got I robbed when I was telling you so, earlier. So you were in UE then? The University of the Worst of England. I mean, the oh, University dear. of the West of England. Right. So you didn't enjoy that? No. Okay. I didn't. Sad face at the party. Oh, dear. Well, I, I did knew, business I studies. I knew there were, friends. there's certain things I shouldn't bring up that and your uh, previous comedy exploits. Uh, is obviously it's not one. about me, it's about uh, that. No, you're quite right, and we'll <laughs> get back to that uh, in a second. No, but um, I, I, I understand what you're saying, though. It's like you... You I do start... compare, don't you? Because you've always yeah. got those louder characters in the class. I know. You'll always have that, and but they g completely make you feel like shit about yourself if you're not vocal or you don't like to show your work to everyone. I'm really aware I can be like that, and I'm really sorry because I No, no, really you bad. don't do it in a way that sort of, look at me, look at me, I yeah. can do this, I can do that. But I'm, I mean, I used to be, and I cringe sometimes when I go back to the podcast. I listen to it. Go, oh, I wish I just shut up. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wish yeah, I, I would just sometimes. shut up. Yeah, no, I know, I know. I message you and say I'm going to mm. shut up now. Um, but I, I did business studies initially, and I quit after my second year because we were in. Oh God, it was fucking horrendous. We were. I was sitting in a some lecture or other. And um, we were talking about demographics and we had five different videos of different people shopping at different supermarkets and we had to sit there in this lecture very matter-of-factly. So if we were going to label which, who was shopping at Sainsbury's, who was shopping at Quick Save, who was shopping at, I was just like, ah, oh, fuck this, this is bullshit. Um, it wasn't like I was on some like complete sort of um, Marxist rant, but then I ended up going into politics, which was even fucking worse, you know. Um, that was just a, a shit show of, of people grandstanding. And I, I, I cringe, but I'm I'm guilt I'm so guilty of it. I really am. I get into I go into rants and so no, you're it's more putting other people down that ah. like standing on it like trampling other people to get ahead. That's that's where the problem is, I think. Mm. Yeah. No, no, no. I, 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 That's not how you come across to me. I thought you were very kind. Thank you for the reassurance. <laughs> um, tonight's, 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 uh, tonight's psychotherapy is sponsored by Natalie. <laughs> um, and Talisker. Um, but no, it's... Um, but I know what you mean. You can sit there and uh, the one class I was in, we... It, it did. I just felt like I was out of my depth every day. But see, I was going to kind of spring to your defence a little bit because you said, can you just say... Like five, ten minutes ago, you were one grade away from going to do medicine. Yeah, again, that's just pressure. Like, <laughs> yeah, but like, 
I'm I'm quite matter of fact sometimes, perhaps a little bit too much, like a blunt instrument. But I know having people in my family who've been, you know, medical profession. One, um, it's incredibly difficult. So to me, that's like I when you say that, I'm kind of like, really, you felt like that with that level of ability to feel that you were outgunned in in poetry but then you have to sort of sacrifice a lot of other things and i realized that that i'd have to completely give up my creativity because that became my focus and i was doing it to please other people all the time but you were capable of doing it so, so you, long as i give up everything else like you know life but i wouldn't say that you should ever feel as though yourself not to be you know what's the word capable of sparring with people i mean if you're able to do if you're able to get close to medicine there's not much else you're not able to get close to i think when you're in that frame of mind that there's there's no logic in it mm. at all mm. when you're when you're you know you're completely self-doubting and you're suffering with mental health i was suffering from mental health issues at the time and mm. logic just didn't come into it because mm. every day yeah. it would just be you're not good enough battle. you're not good enough yeah no i know that voice i've i've heard that voice yeah i suffer from anxiety myself i made no bones about it on the podcast and i know that but that you voice. know what i think that's one of the reasons why people who are artistic, who have that sensitive kind of center, should we say, gravitate towards the arts. Yeah. Whether it's poetry or music well, it's or beautiful. painting or whatever. Yeah, but I think it does tend to attract people who who have got some, should we say, issues, uh, for the want of a better word. I mean, I'm I hate saying, that word. I, well, I'm, I'm only saying that because... Peccadillos. Okay, but look, I'm only saying that because... That's coined by Robin Williams in the film oh, Good Will Hunting, right. which you, then ties into cancel right. culture because it was <laughs> done by Miramax, which is a Harvey Weinstein company. Anyway, there I we go. I knew you'd bring it. I knew you'd do the old... Uh, oh, that fucks link. me off more than anything else. It's one of my favourite films of all time. What, Good Will Hunting? Good Will Hunting. It's a good uh, film. Hunting. It's fucking incredible. It's one of the most... Me- it, it's this whole thing about lived experience as opposed to learnt experience where Will is being bollocked by Robin Williams on the um, uh, uh, on the bench um, in the park because Will's just an upstart and he says stuff about Robin's wife the day before, but Robin won't give up on him. It's such a fucking clever stuff. It is a good anyway. film. Sorry, but we were, saying, we were saying anyway. Yeah, we were we were um, saying about the arts field generally. Yes. I mean, do you think that's one of the reasons why you, maybe you made that decision to kind of follow the artistic route because of a need to do it? I think so. I think because so. I always wanted to help people, and I, I think I wanted to do medicine one to please people, two because I'd felt like medical professionals had helped me in the past when I've had to go into you know, hospitals all the time with diabetes appointments. I've been so thankful for my nurses who've listened to the mental aspect of it as well. Then I realized actually I can yeah. follow my passion and still help people just by being honest about things. And I, I love that about the poetry scene and the art scene. People are quite open about it. It's not a stigmatized. Yeah. I, think we I mean, um, Simon and I have, have, have mentioned this before about, um, I think you said either the last podcast or the one before about it being a, that you saw poetry as being a really good form of psychotherapy. Mm. And I essentially respond to saying, yeah, I think a lot of my work is like that. But I think a lot of poets are like that. When poetry's right, it's absolutely terrifying from a musician's point of view because you've got nothing backing you, no drums, no guitar, no bass, no arrangement. You're just up there fighting it. From a musician's point of view, it's terrifying because you're holding the whole room as mm. one person. Do you remember that guy who was a bit of a viral sensation? Is it Neil Hilburn who has the... I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know the Spoken guy. guy yeah. yeah, and he had... I can't... He's a stutter or a stammer or something and he... Was that the one? Yeah, and he also has a... Like, he has a problem with OCD. Okay, and he yeah, was lamenting the loss of mm. his partner uh, because the, the relationship just came to an end. It's just one of those things. Yeah. You know, they fell out of love. You know, it's nobody's fault. These things happen. Sucks ass, but it just does. And, th- th- you know, I was watching it. You know, I'm a, I'm a dude. It's I'm how a, raw it was. Yeah, exactly. It? it was just no hold yeah. bad. It was, this is what, this is how I feel. And I haven't filtered uh, it in any way. I came up as a dumb metler. So it's like, yeah, how loud is it? Yeah, can I have it louder, please? Is it how heavy is it? Or can I have it heavier? You know, so I wanted something that's going to shock and hit me. And I watched that. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know, it was like, pow. So 
that's what I was sort of trying to say about the poetry. There is, it's not jealousy on my behalf, but there's certainly a huge amount of envy for it because the amount of fucking bottle it takes. Well, you were saying this on our podcast that we just did the one, you know, sort of head to head one. Yeah. Um, and saying that you kind of uh, like the, I can't remember what the word you use, not authenticity, but the sort of bravery to kind of just it is bear brave. your soul, essentially. It's brave as fuck. On page or, or sort of spoken out loud. You've got to think about it, right? When a guy gets up with a guitar or a girl or whatever pronoun or gender you want to be with a guitar, you've got a barrier. It's like, oh, I got this in front of me, fuck you. And then, but when you're like that with a mic, because if I've done stand up badly, that's you and you and the mic, baby. Nothing else. You, that, and that. Good luck. See you later, buddy. You can't make a noise and distortion. And or, oh, yeah, look, look how many hours are spent. But I think the other thing with poetry, though, um, is that the kind of realness to it and the authenticity that comes with it is about that level of honesty, mm. which, and, and, and that's, the, the, and that's one of the things I really like about your poetry now is that you, you share yourself in, you know, on the page. And I tend not to do an awful lot of that. And, and that's you. been, and that's been a kind of criticism from some of my friends. It's like, well, where are you on the page? Where are you in those poems? Um, so I tend to talk about kind of bigger themes, but actually the smaller stuff, the you, um, but I think I there's always a piece of you that is in it, though, no matter what you write. That, and I, do, I am big on writing as therapy. And it's something I've explored with my next collection. I've done it even more. And I've turned... Um, I make no secret about the fact I struggled with an eating disorder for a long time. And I've turned it into this character. And I just called it small. And I imagined it as this little demon. And suddenly it becomes this third person in a relationship or this third little creature. Mm. And suddenly we're going on this journey with what is this demon that's interfering with everything in daily life? And that was that was almost like a therapy itself in writing it because I felt I felt shaken by the time I'd I'd finished writing it. So the next book that is being released next year, mm -hmm. did you say it's called Small? Yeah. So is the theme of that around that kind of demon or the, the kind of that's the thread running through it. Right. There is still, you know, Greek mythology and there's other things in it as well, but this has more of a narrative arc to it because I wanted to give whatever was living in my head, I thought, what if it could speak for itself and I could talk to it? Because you're always told to do that in therapy sessions. Reason I remember, with it. Yeah, I remember sitting in a, in a session once and I said, okay, that chair there, imagine someone's sitting on it and you get angry with them and tell them what you think. I just then I felt like a fucking idiot. I can't, I can't do it while you're watching me. I just feel stupid. So I just started crying, went out to my car and suddenly just started writing this poetry on the back of a receipt. And then that's just how the collection started. Um, right. So that's a very heavy thing to deal with. Um, what you've obviously gone through. I mean, you, you I mean, I was the part of me wanted to sort of interject and go, I I don't blame you for feeling that way, considering that um, the way things are in the media and the way things are portrayed. And shut up, sorry, somebody's outside. I was very, getting very deep and emotional. Um, but there's there's there is a pressure on everyone to live up to this this thing, you know. Um, no, but there is. I, I genuinely no, think. No, I was I'm trying to, I wasn't I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say it without sort of because yeah. I haven't gone and walked through your shoes. I'm trying to empathise a but little I bit, but not be condescending. What small is as well is. Oh, sorry. I think what small is as well is it's a way of saying that everyone's got their little demon, and to me, it's small. But anyone else is small might be something else. Whether they deal with alcoholism or anxiety, or everyone's just got something they're hiding or some little voice there. And it's just acknowledging that little voice and turning it almost into almost like a comic character in a way, because you can like it's like a needy child. You can't leave it because it's like you're responsible for it. It's your child. You can't just abandon it no matter how shitty it's being, because it's a, you want to protect it so as well. Now, if you don't mind me asking, um, do you feel that some of those sessions you would have had mm -hmm. sort of talking to people mm -hmm. or kind of counselling, do you find that that has helped you be more open with your poetry or kind of pushed you a little bit further down the route of um, self-expression on the page? It's definitely influenced my poetry and it had it did get me writing again. And perhaps it wasn't meant to, it was supposed to make me talk, but I just can't. 
do that in a just to a complete stranger just one-on-one in a room if I know they're just taking notes and I'm meant to be doing it whereas if I go away on my own then suddenly I've got all this stuff that I've wanted to say and it just comes out onto the page you're the inverse of me because I can do that oh yeah yeah well because I've had counseling mm. uh, after a really horrific breakup and it was like the easiest thing for me I was like help me for god's sake mm. I can't talk to anybody of my friends oh, okay so but it's different I think different you know what I, th- I think just on the counseling thing I think it's it's worth pointing out I think everyone should do counseling. yeah I was gonna say I absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. 110% I, I, think yeah. Everyone in the 21st century, the way things are geared and the way that we're supposed to live up to certain things, whether, as I said, animal, mineral or fish or whatever, and the way Instagram culture is and social media, I think everyone needs bloody counselling. They do, because it's, f- it's a fucking war zone out well, there. Well, there's too much fakery online, which doesn't help. And I think when you come to um, having authors or artists sharing themselves in that honest way that you do that... Um, I think it helps other people because other people are able to read and absorb it and take it on board and, and, and reflect on themselves if they're not able to share it, uh, you know, for themselves. That, that's why, I, I mean, that's why I love the older generation, like 60s and 70s and 50s. You know, a lot of my friends are older than me <laughs> because there isn't that time for bullshit. You know what I mean? There isn't that time for, I don't know, not Ben, um, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think um, older generations have a different attitude to um, life generally, don't they? Because Why do we scrap heap older people? Because I've said this to you before on the podcast when Aline was on. Why do we as a culture scrap people when they get to a certain age? Wow. And then why is it in Eastern culture, it's, it's veneration in Korea, Japan, China and Russia as well? Why are older people venerated think, in the West? We don't do it. I think in the West it's to do with and India putting, well. putting a monetary value almost in a perverse sort of way on people and it's like well what's their economic value um the older you get the you know sort of less important you become because you're less able to be exploited by financial institutions like mortgages or you're less able to contribute as much through uh, taxation if you um retire i think we've got a different attitude to engaging in life um and that's why I think in some, you know, in the East, for instance, and I, I, w- I was really pleased that you did your book launch, for instance, in Kolkata, um, because the experience that you've had there clearly has been a really valuable one. It's, be, it's so misrepresented as well. I just think people should, just, I don't know, either go out there or just learn more about it or just make connections. This is why it's so important, because still as a society, we've just got the wrong idea about other countries and we've got all these misconceptions that stop us visiting places. And but, that, but that's really weird, isn't it, as well? Mm. Because like, if you think about it, um, travel is like so easy today. Mm. And yet, why is it that we're not taking um, the opportunities when we do travel to actually learn a little bit more about mm. people rather than just like sticking yourselves in a pocket uh, quite well, isolated being on and, your phone taking pictures while you're in yeah, or, by the Ganges, you yeah. know, or or staying in the hotel complex and just eating the twenty four hour buffet all bloody That's day. what I loved about it, is that we stayed on the overnight trains, we stayed in hostels, we stayed in tiny little guest houses run by families, and we spoke to people and we just learned more about them. So, so, so who organised that trip then? That um, that was British Council, Literature Wales are involved, uh, VCV were involved, and. Parthian. Because I think you've you've been, well, I don't want to say lucky, because obviously mm-hmm. you haven't been lucky in that sense, but you've had a, an amazing opportunity to, to see something which is in an organised setting as well. It's a lot safer, isn't it? If you just think, right, I'll just do a bit of backpacking or whatever, you're going to see it, but there's a lot more pitfalls. Whereas that, it's organised, you can actually go out and, and have a little look around. Um, yeah, I definitely need to travel more on the back of that. But then they, because it was an exchange, they came over here and learned a lot more about Wales. And I think people got like, oh, wow. a lot of misconception about Wales <laughs> where, as well. Where did you take them down to Joe's? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we took them to Tina with the North Wales. Yeah. We went to Hay Festival. Um, we did some readings in Cardiff. We Roma uh, Fish Stefan. Bar. Yeah, Roma Fish Bar yeah, Gusainen. Yeah. Big shout out to Gusainen, Gusainen Massive. <laughs> the big G's. I like yeah. Gosling Ground. Uh, yeah, but so yeah, you, you, there was this whole cultural exchange between the two mm. places. It was just about learning from each other and sharing our writing as well. Hands on the table. I'm terrified. I am terrified of traveling. Get yourself a passport, mate. I've got a passport, you cheeky bugger. Have you? Is it in date? It is, of course, it's in it's date. It's still valid. It's still valid. Right. Terrified okay. of traveling. 
I, well, I don't like flying. I'll be honest. I BA brackets. No, I, well, yeah, a little bit. Oh, have a little glass of milk, mate. Uh, let's <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> yeah. It's like wake up the other end. Yeah, you can get away with that today. Um, um, no. no. no um, but no, I, I'm terrified of traveling. I am. I like traveling around the UK. But you've done France by the sound of it. You're talking, you're talking <laughs> done France and Spain. On, on well, France is an amazing country. If I was going to go anywhere... Oh, God. See, this is the thing about me. I know I'm lazy. I'd go somewhere and never come back. That would be, that would be well, it. Well, you were talking last week with Emily uh, van der Ploeg um, about Canada, and you were saying you'd quite like to go there. Yeah, I want to go there to the Yukon because I know there's wildlife there that could kill me, and that's it. I think you're, too th you're thinking too hard about it. You should just pick a yeah. place and just go there yeah. because it's probably not what you think it is anyway because everyone just gets to like, I'm, he likes to romanticise this uh, yeah. Simon Howard Jones. Well, I'm not delusional. I'm just saying that, like, if if I if I want to go somewhere, I want to go somewhere where there's like vistas. I mean, like Canada's somewhere I've always wanted to go. It's just the fact that. Um, what did I watch recently? The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is the most recent Coen Brothers. Well, it's not most recent. It's like a, it's a couple of Coen Brothers small stories all stuck together. And there's one story in it with Tom Waits where he's a, um, he's a, he's a panhandler. He's panhandling for gold and he comes to this valley and it's just beautiful. And I was just watching it going, yeah, man, I could, I just, I want to be on my own and out there and that's just beautiful. And he's like talking to the animals and stuff. Not like Dr. Doolittle, you know what I mean? But it's like, there's something about that being just next to it and whatnot. I don't, I wouldn't want to go to Dubai, for example. I don't want to slate Dubai, but, um, Maybe we should cut this but from you, the podcast. But, but, but you wouldn't watch the World Cup in Dubai. I fucking I hate it when. Right, I'm gonna go on a, I'm gonna go on a social political rent now. Right, will we be editing that out? Probably rent room, but um, I hate it when I have people talk to me. Oh, we went to Dubai. Oh, how was it? Oh, it was a lovely complex. Or did you go out? Oh no, no, you can't go out. And it's like it's like well, what, you know what I mean? It's not just a fucking playground for you. And I just don't. But, I that, don't but get that's it, not you know? just to buy me, is it? I no, mean, I but know you get it's that not just to buy, but with everyone. You know what I mean? mean? It's like I mean, if if people book a package holiday, there had there has been a tendency, I think, for people just to book the complex, haven't they, mm. with their family? They mm. just don't go, go out. Go for a British Benidorm. breakfast. Then. I know. Oh, I, I, just, just I went pathetic. to Benidorm in July. It yeah. Was, oh, was tell us more. Tell us it more. It was exactly as you'd imagine it, actually. Well, did you enjoy it? It was good fun. Were you with your family? Yeah. That's the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah, how many? How many of you went? Was it mum, dad, brothers? Sisters? It was my dad, and it was my sister as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it was mostly my, me and my sister going out in the nights, and yeah, it and was everything you'd expect. But you it to had be. fun. It was. It was just a blowout. Well, that's yeah. the most amazing thing. But about I it. think the difference is that you went there f in full knowledge that that was the yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah. That's what you're doing. You know what you're getting. I think you've got to mix it up. You know, every now and again, it's okay to go and do that sort of thing where. Um, you're going f just for the break. You just need the break in the downtime. No, that was just a break. I mean, yeah. I'll go back. You know, I really want to do some culture now, but uh, yeah, I wasn't going to find an awful lot of that where we were. Not when there's a no Neils down the road, is it? No. <laughs> Coley, love you. Where, where are you spoons? from? Weatherspoon, son. Weatherspoons. Oh, we've got one over here. Yeah. We're taking back Gibraltar next week, although we already got it. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. I don't travel well. I don't travel well. So, I mean, Scotland is probably about as far as I'm ever going to get. To be honest with you, that that'll be my Canada. Lovely. I love it. Love the place. Um, my sister lives there. Last time I was in Edinburgh it was a long time ago, but um, it was at the Haymarket. Uh, so I arrived on a plane, and I had haggis, neeps, and tatties, and it was absolutely incredible. Haggis is great. Yeah, I know. I love the stuff. Yeah. It's, it, like, I had it presented in three lines in front of me. Well, shamefully, I've never tried it. I've done a line so of haggis. I don't, I don't really. But know no, it is. that's how they do haggis, neeps, and tatties. It's like literally. It's like literally not a line. They didn't. I didn't key a line <laughs> of haggis. That'd be mental. Um, but no, it's like they present it like that, and it was just absolutely beautiful. Mm. And Scottish culture is absolutely incredible. Um, but yeah, one of the most important things that we haven't addressed tonight is what everybody's on in terms of drinking. Right. Do you nice. want to do your usual plug? I'll do the plug. I'll so Natalie, plug. every week hmm. he has to plug because he's desperate to get sponsorship. Okay. We want to be a sponsor on oh, okay. the uh, podcast. Yeah. Um, so we've switched up a bit today. No, you switched up. Well, it was actually Alan. Alan Gibbard, who who meandered in earlier. Yeah, Alan arrived with a with a, a number of beers. Alan, again, it's beautiful to see you, sir. Yes, yes, yes. So, salute, um, yaki dago boy. Very good. Um, so I'm drinking Gower Brewery Gower IPA, five percent, um, which is best enjoyed responsibly, obviously. But it says with a good view, 
Um, so I don't really know uh, how that adds to it. But um, yes, yeah, so that's what I'm drinking. I'm also sampling <laughs> an alcohol-free Copperberg premium cider, mm. which is just a little bit like fizzy Ribena, which is not great. So the Gower uh, Brewery one is uh, currently sitting at a 7 out of 10 for me. Natalie's the most sensible person here. What are you yeah. on, Natalie? Straight vodka. <laughs> oh, brutal. <laughs> brutal. And no one can dispute that. They can't dispute they it. They can't dispute we got, it. We got, so we got on camera, it looks like it possibly could be a vodka or it's water. Um, oh, let, well done. Let's not, no, no we let, let's not bust that myth. Do you want uh, to tell the kids there's no Santa as well? Oh, I'm a poet. Go. I drink everything straight. Yeah. yeah. What are you drinking, Simon? I've got a hell of a lot of respect for that. Um, I am drinking the most important uh, whiskey uh, to me, single malt, Talisker. Um, I'm a huge fan of single malts. Uh, I don't like single malt. Really? Why don't... Oh, no. that's fairly controversial. Oh, no, I, I want to hear suggest. more. I like brandy and I like bourbon and I don't like Scotch. No, whiskey. but I'm okay with, uh, um, you know, bourbon. I, I, I love it. I mean, yeah. do you have a particular favourite? I mean, Jim Bean, uh, Maker's Mark. I mean, what, what do you like? Wild turkey? Wild turkey. Yeah. Mm. Is that because of Hunter S. Thompson? <laughs> No, I just like it. You just like it? Okay. No, no, I hate, look, there wasn't like an accusatory finger point, but like that's how I came to it. It's because like oh, that was okay. his, that was his. Uh, Did you start there and then go into, you know, single malt scotch whiskey? My dad, my dad oh, okay. was a big whiskey drinker. Um, and I used to drink nothing but Jack Daniels and Coke because it was the only thing I could handle. And then I went into Wild Turkey because Hunter, I was a, I was a very big fan of Hunter S. Thompson, still am. And, um, I'm going to say his name and then you're just going to fucking flinch. You know who I'm going to say? The Hitch. Christopher Hitchens. Oh, God. Favourite whiskey. Keep was... bringing him back up. Yeah, because you need to read him because he's no, good. No, no, no. Let's get back to Hunter S. Thompson. Okay. Um, well, Hitch, so... liked cut, uh, Hitch, Hitch liked um, Black Label. So there, right, Johnny okay. Walker. Oh, no, did he? Because I quite like that one as well. But There's Johnny Walker like Black, Hitch. Johnny Walker Red, and Johnny Walker Blue. And Johnny Walker Blue is the most expensive. Johnny Walker Red's the cheapest. Well, he's got good taste then. But um, you said that before as well. Maybe the other stuff, not so much. But what, um, how did you? Because uh, like the whole um, bourbon thing is quite a, it's quite a new thing. It's quite a new trend, really. Where did you? Um, I've got a lot of respect for that. That's pretty. No, no, bad. I start with as soon as you start with Jack Daniels, mm. and then tried it without the Coke, and realised it was nice, and then yeah, went to mm. Jim Beam, and then just tried all different ones. Jim Beam's nicer than Jack Daniels. It is nicer, yeah. And everybody doesn't seem to realise how nice it actually is. It is a really good sipping with sipping bourbon. Um and um yeah, wild turkey is like is a real kick to the face. Um have you ever tried Knob Creek at all or Buffalo or any of the, those ones at all? No, I tried mon monkey shoulder and didn't like I that. Tried that. No. Stay away from bullet bourbon. It yeah. is shit. Okay. I it won't is care. rubbish. But if you want a really nice one, Maker's Mark is a really, really, really mm -hmm. nice I've one. tried that. That is very nice. It's a yeah. beautiful bottle. Yeah, it is a beautiful bottle. My dream is to have an entire shelf of bourbons and single malts. See, that's why you're a musician. You want to go out and make money, whereas we're poets and we're like, we'll never make money. We'll never have, you know. No, I don't want to make. A shelf. No, no, no. shelf of them. That's the dream. No, no, no. I don't want to, like, make money and have people come around and look at the shelf and, like, look at the oak there. It's more okay, of a go, case... Yeah, look at my collections. No, 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 no. Okay. It's like, come round. That's where I am. I mean, I want to come, I'm lonely as a person. I want people to come around and get drunk with me and imbibe me. Come round, I'm lonely. Come round, I'm lonely. Come get drunk. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I mean, what the hell have I got to lose at 38? Good old-fashioned honesty, mate. Yeah. Come round, I'm lonely. Come and have any number of whiskies from different regions of Scotland and Kentucky. But you're also a metaler, so metalers have got a different attitude oh, on. Metalers, metalers have got a different approach to the old drinking... Uh, Seen, I think. I'm not a metal. One of my favourite artists, musicians, is Elliot Smith. I'm not a metal. So. Right. Okay. Well, I, well, I like I like I heavy corrected. metal a lot, but the older I get, the more bored I get by a lot of things at the moment. To be honest with you, you know, music's just fucking awful at the moment. It you don't want to do you in the back in neck, like head banging either, do you? When you get older, you know, you can't play guitar like that as well. Oh, okay, it's just yeah. impossible. You can use, you, you, do you know? It's oh, you may look cool windmilling. <laughs> but you know when you spin round really fast? Yeah. yeah, try doing that and then play guitar afterwards. It's impossible. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't look cool. No, my band predominantly writes about supermarkets which aren't in existence anymore. Oh, you hyper value. Oh, it was hyper value, yeah. right. Right, okay. Back to Natalie, please. Back to Natalie. It's not about me. Back to Natalie. Or you. Right, okay. Um, 
So one of the things I think we missed uh, in the first half of the podcast was you branching out to, into the spoken word mm. scene as well. Um, so you came runner up, didn't you, this year mm. in the Swansea Poetry Slam that um, uh, I compare. Let's just uh, uh, stick, st- stick that in. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah. Um, so how did you find that then? Because that's not something you would uh, normally do, no. I would suggest. It was a bit surreal. I think I've got more and more into spoken word poetry and I admire spoken word poets so much. It's almost a different craft completely and I wanted to challenge myself because I'd gone through school and I'd been really, really quiet and I just, people used to call me a mute all the time because I just didn't speak and I just thought, right, okay, I'm going to challenge it. I'd like to one day get up and do spoken word. Um, so I just practice and practice and practice, just completely alone, just sitting with my cat a lot of the time, just practicing, um, just so gave it a go. And because I, I've judged the poetry slam before, I know what a supportive atmosphere it is with the Swansea ones. I felt, I felt even if I'd got knocked out in the first round, I'd have felt okay about it. Whereas there is other ones which are a bit more competitive. Sorry for sneezing, but Mm. there is something very important you said there. Mm. How many cats you got? I've only got, well, I don't have any anymore because I've given her to my nan. But yeah, I have the one. I'd have like six million if I could. What cat was it? Was it just a tabby or? It was just a tabby I got from the rescue centre. Oh, I really want a cat again. You've got a dog, mate. You can't do that. We can't. No, Dusty, can't. Dusty's fine with cats. It's the most right. amazing thing ever. He doesn't. Cats don't bother him. Foxes and birds he hates. I'll get six. If I would and could, I'd have a Maine Coon. I would have either oh, a Maine Coon or a mm. Norwegian forest cat. Mm, hands down. Or any cat. I wouldn't care. Just a cat would be great, but I can't where I live. What did you say your cat's called? Pixie. The thing, is, the thing is, she's called Pixie because she's really small, but my nan's now overfed her, so she's like a tank, so... You're calling her Panzer now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, she's just called the barrel. <laughs> In it rolls. I love cats, so I'm... I'm cats are nice. I'm, I'm very allergic to cats, unfortunately, but... Um, That's because you're a cat racist. It's very actually well documented in cat circles. Right. We know. Okay, you've gone no, off no, on the old no. tangent there, haven't you? No, um, no. But... No, it's the dog. The, the dog is where it's at. You, um, oh, that, that's that's a Labrador, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hugo. Oh. Who I love. Let's get him I love Hugo. He's, he's a nice little fellow. Yeah, he's isn't great, he? man. Yeah. I yeah. want him and Dusty to meet and just be like, hey, bud, hey, you're like a bigger version of me. I know, and I'm smaller than you. Quite strange they haven't met. No. We need to sort that I out. I think Dusty might be too much for him because ah. Hugo does have the epilepsy thing. Yeah, and I'd does, feel yeah. like shit if yeah. something happened to him and my dog brought it up, brought it upon. Yeah, like, c- certain things kind of throw him off, but um, yeah. So why Pixie then? What what's the name from? Um, it was just it was because I wasn't allowed to call her Medusa at the time, or or else did I want to call her Ah uh, Mrs Nesbit. Well, as in <laughs> Rabsy Nesbit. No, as in Mrs Nesbit, as when like Buzz Lightyear puts puts that like dresses up with his little flowery hat and just says I'm Mrs Nesbit. I was like, that's a great name for a cat. I wanted a pet goat, and I still do. Right. You should just start bringing animals on the podcast and it would be okay, wouldn't it? I think that's not You can show. actually have goats in the house. Pygmy goats, you can. Well, actually, Jeff Hayden has said that um, I, I can bring Hugo up here. So dogs are officially allowed in. Or maybe it's just my dog, I don't would know. Would a podcast work where it was just Hugo and Dusty just like with the mic no, on? No, because they'd be mental. And, it would be hysterical. Um, it would be, it would be hysterical. You just hear clipping around the front room all the time or in the hallway. There'd just be a lot of noise. What is the difference between poetry and spoken word? Uh, because poetry, I think you are just purely crafting it for the page. Whereas spoken word, there's a, there's a lot more effort going into the rhythm. And it's less about... You still want striking images, but they're less of a craft than you'd have on the page. That This comes more into what you're saying and how it sounds aloud. Whereas... It's more about, the, it's almost like the visual of the po- poem matters as well on the page. You want the layout to be right. You want the f- flow to be right with the line breaks. Whereas you're just relying on how you're delivering it otherwise. Where does the adrenaline come in more? Is it with the spoken word or the poetry? Oh, the spoken word. Do you because feel like it's, it's almost you can get into those characters then. Because mm. sometimes my poems haven't really come alive for me until I've stood out and spoken it out loud. And I'm, I'm mm. that character then. I'm that voice. Mm. There's a hell of a lot of fight in you you know what i mean there's like there's like it, you, i don't know about you but like it seems like you 
Oh god! I'm from Simon, that's what I do. Yeah, but that doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> come on. I mean, but you know, yeah, but you buy the lucha, you know. I mean, um, there's nothing wrong with lucha. It's lovely. Um, I like lucha. Good fishing um, in the estuary. Fantastic uh, lava bread. I want to give a big shout out there to all lava bread and cockle pickers in the area. Have you had <laughs> lava bread? Well, no, you haven't. Have you? It's why an do you assume amazing source. Why do you haven't? Natalie, come on. Cockles, great. Cockles is vinegar from Swansea Market, yes. Right, Batter cockles. Right, well, well, what's the problem with lava bread then? It's all right, but it is a bit still, you know, it's green gunk in it. No, it's not. It's amazing. Bit of cheese, bread, bit of bacon, but you can't have any no, of those well, things. No, well, I, I can't have cockles or that um, in that oh, case because, vegan. yeah, vegan. So that's uh, that throws things off a little bit, doesn't it? But no, I was just sort of saying, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, the, the whole ghost sign and thing, because that, that's an interesting thing, because Chris keeps going on, Chris has gone on about this, and like, there's different parts of Swansea, like, a little bit of tribalism. Mm. And, you know, like, we had a bit of a jibe before he came on, and said, oh, ghost sign and whatnot, yeah. And yeah, you, you, you guys are a little bit, you know, you're a little bit wily. I, oh, God, that's wrong. I'll probably have to cut that out of the podcast. No, no, but no. But why is there a, a tribalism? Scrappy. Yeah, but why is there a tribalism like that in Swansea? Because you're no distance away, really, are you? It's the same, like, whatever... I think you'll always get that. Wherever you are, there's always going to be, like, oh, they're from Gassine and they're from Town Hill, they're from... You know, you always got these different places that get a bad, really bad rep. But actually, when you go to them, it's... Have you ever been to the well, Bont? Yes. Do you like people from the Bont? I've got friends from Bont, There yes. we go, exactly. See, but th this is what... But so in a way, it's kind of a joke as well, though, and mm. we take it... like. It's mm. it's just, you know, we we don't take it seriously. When I was growing up, I had a mate called Ben Schwedick who used to live in um, Gorsainen and it was in a time where you could rent computer games and we used to go around Gorsainen Market and we'd rent a SNES game for a weekend and we'd That's play. still there with a really random carpet shop as well that no one ever buys from. What, the market? Mm. Mm. That room of Fish Bar 2000 isn't there anymore, is it? No. Oh. It's a strange name for fish bar, though. That, yeah, it? but you've never been there, have you? I had been there. Had That's you the had point. a batch and chips? A batch and chips. Imagine yeah, you it. pull the bread out of the, She's out amazing. Of the yeah. batch mm. loaf and stuff it full of chips. Chips, no, imagine it. No, Half a loaf of bread, yeah. chips. Just imagine it, mate. Not quite, <laughs> not quite as filthy as chips, cheese, and gravy. I hate oh, chips, no. cheese, and gravy. That was a Cardiff thing for, for, for a while. That's where I discovered that little piece. What, down Chip Alley? Yes. Chips and gravy, yes, no cheese. Wow. Yeah, I think you missed out, mate. So when are you... Um, so, okay. Um, so it brings out a very different side in you when you're having to do the spoken word and you're taking on different character sort of narrative voices in your delivery. Um, how do you find... Is, is that at all... I would say marketable, but is there any potential to put that down and actually be published with something with spoken word. Can you transcribe any of that or does it lose something? Um, it's difficult. I think if you want to be purely a spoken word artist, you have to get by on your performance first before you get it down on the page. Whereas I tend to get it on the page first and then speak it. So I might have to edit a few just to make them more sort of spoken word. Would you ever do an album like that? Because it lends itself more to an audio um, sort of... It would be yeah. like a separate project. I couldn't, for example, pick up one of my books and turn that into an album because mm. it doesn't always work like that. I would have to specifically work mm. on a spoken word project. Do you think you ever will? Because it's I a... would love to, yeah. Mm. And I think that will be my next project. So I'm working on a collaborative collection with Mari and one, Mari Ellis Dunning, if you've heard of her. Um, and once that's done, I think I might move into spoken word a little more. Well, that's a really positive statement because I think before you've been a little bit more um, not uh, reserved about it. What that it's, it's the wrong word. Um, a little bit more cautious, mm -hmm. I think, about the whole spoken word thing because um, I think there's quite a nice crossover. Now I know what you mean. You're saying that like um, uh, the sort of written word uh, it kind of stands in its own right, and it it you know it, you can get the depth down on the page, can't you? And you can pick through it and present it well, all the rest of it. And spoken word, you inject that energy, and it's yeah. you do you do change your language to some degree. But um, we were talking on a couple of podcasts um, that we've mentioned that um, you know Dylan Thomas was probably the first spoken word mm. 
mm-hmm. should we say, poet or sort of one of them. Yeah. Because he, you know, he embraced the idea of standing up, injecting more energy into it, performing more with his work. Um, and I think people often don't look at Dylan Thomas like that. No, I think he's, he's one of the best examples just because even when you read it in your head, there's a musicality to it. But when he actually reads it aloud... It's even under Milkwood, it has that sort of like, even the first few lines, it's just sort of bobbing along. And it's that's when the magic comes into it. And it does, ha- in, even in the editing process, if you can read your poems aloud, you notice where things are jarring. And even if you never do a performance of it, you know how it's going to work on the page because you can hear how it might be sounded if people are reading it aloud. And you know what? I think poetry needs to be spoken Mm. it needs to be read out yeah i think if um we take the kind of um sort of more traditional line where you sort of publish a book it gets on a bookshelf people buy it take it home read it Mm -hmm. you you you've kind of lost something there i think because i think it's really important to hear the poet's voice Mm -hmm. hear where the intonation is um it just brings the magic out doesn't it it does yeah and i've talked to readers as well who've only ever read the work aloud and I've never thought of it that way because I've never gone through a book and read it all aloud. Um, or people who've maybe not understood poetry and have come along to support, say, friends who are unfamiliar with it. And then say, I wasn't expecting that, but now I understand what you'd wrote before and what you meant by it when I couldn't understand it on the page. It's because you've put character... It's almost theatrical in a way. You've got to act it out a little bit. Is any topic ever off limits for you for writing? In either the poetry or um, the, and you don't have to say which yeah. topic that would be. But are, are there ever sort of things that no, I I just can't touch that. I still find it really difficult. Like even now speaking about like even the next collection, it I'm on edge because I know it's there's almost like there's so much stigma around mental health. I almost feel feel ashamed of it, and I'm so nervous about it. Going Why are you out. ashamed of it? If you don't mind me asking, it's because of the stigma, and I'm thinking, oh God, people I know are going to know about this or. Even though I've talked about it before and I've written articles for, for different publications about it, it's still like it's it's such a secretive sort of illness that you it's terrifying to get it out in the open. Uh, but without sounding like overly logical mm. about it, I mean you have a job, don't you? Yeah. Hold down a job, drive mm-hmm. a car. Yeah. Productive member of society, pay taxes. Mm-hmm. I think you're doing very well. And without sounding patronizing sort of thing. Yeah. Not sort of saying, Oh jolly good, pick yourself up, <laughs> this and fair, carry on, move on. But I mean, as soon as people sort of understand that i think that we all function there's a lot mm. of people who are functioning with yeah. these i don't want to say difficulties these I things. Think, no i think that's a really good point mate um because well, i didn't make it no 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 but it's, it's self just evident like, from it's, what natalie's it's, it's sort of fleshing table. it out isn't it because like particularly with mental health um you know we have a tendency to think of people who perhaps aren't in work mm. as you were saying you know, that um, people who aren't functioning perhaps as other members of society, it's more visible with them. But yeah, mental health affects people that you just wouldn't expect it. Look at it this way, right? You, to an, anyone you say, right, you're going to be born to a set of parents and then eventually you're going to die and the universe is infinite. Good luck, see how it goes on. How many people are not going to have some sort of breakdown or existential crisis? What's it about? What's the meaning? Is there a God? Isn't there a God? I mean, there's so many things. And that's before you even get to the internet age and everything else that comes on top of it in terms of social pressure and cohesion and everything else and sense of belonging. In but that's the, important, the importance of art, though, isn't it? And I think the importance of poetry particularly. We're fucked without art. It's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. It, it doesn't just bring meaning to people's experience and people's lives, but it also reassures others, which is why I think that... You know, you saying that you want to look at that as a kind of area that needs a bit further exploration Mm -hmm. is a really healthy thing. Um, But it sounds like you've got some reservations about Mm -hmm. putting that little part of you out there, isn't it? That potentially people will judge, isn't it? Yeah, because I've written articles about it and some of the comments that have gone on underneath it, when it goes public like that, have been awful because people don't understand what happens in your mind and they've said it's stupidity and you deserve everything that happened. Oh, fucking hell. Because, because you should have just, you shouldn't have been so stupid. I was like, it's got nothing to do with intelligence. It's the same as if you had a physical illness, there would be something wrong that you'd need to address. So why isn't it the same with mental illness? So is it just a case of trolls? So you, you've, you've, yeah. you've, you've opened your heart up, mm. which is very difficult and incredibly commendable, full stop. And then you have some dipshit basement dweller 
chiming in, who's done nothing. I'm learning to cope with that better now. I know that this collection will bring that sort of thing out, but also from the messages that you get where people have, like I've had people say, I've gone um, to like, I've gone to speak to like, for example, I wrote about eating disorders in a diabetes sort of, um, in that context, because it is, I think it's something like eight, it was 80% or something like that with type one women, they all develop it because you're obsessing about food all the time. And it was something that doesn't even get talked about by medical staff and now they do. And I've had messages of people who said, okay, I've gone and I've told my nurse about it because I didn't realize that what was what it was called or what I was doing until you spoke up about it. And I realized, okay, for all the trolls that you might get, I could be helping someone change their lives as well. So, but with the trolls, I mean, is it just a case of it's just horrible and vindictive and bitter Mm. and it's a dark side of... Yeah, I don't take it well at all. Like, I'm not very... I I don't cope with criticism very well, but I'm learning to get better at it. Do you... Can you see that perhaps it comes from a place of jealousy and envy? Not in my head. I don't don't know. No. Because I only focus on that negative and I need to Mm. learn not to do that so much. I think it's more than that, mate. Mm. I think it's more than jealousy and envy. I think it is... It it can be ignorance as well. Yeah, it's ignorance. But I think there's some deep-rooted kind of negative vibes out there mate i mean yeah well think about it if you if you're a no mark and then somebody mm. comes up and has an opinion and can, is well articulated irrespective of their gender you're gonna feel like shit on you so you're gonna take it out on somebody i mean the um one thing that kind of sprung to my mind there and i don't really know why um because it's maybe slightly off topic but it's slightly racist yeah <laughs> it's not racist it's not racist you'd be uh, pleased to know uh, and so will my parents um but um no there was um i don't know if you saw it in the news was it today or yesterday about greta thunberg hmm. and there was an effigy of her uh, hanging from a bridge oh what God. yeah what? fuck and, off and i think either that's a step too far i'm just wondering mate. whether that was in a I can't remember which country it was in. But anyway, the point is, it was, it was, it was in a European country, right? But um, when you start putting yourself out there and you're She's talking, a kid. She, she's not only just a kid, but she, true. But I Yeah, mean, but you don't... It's a kid. Yeah, no, you know what right. I mean? No, you're right. But, but this is it. When you start talking about things that matter, you know, that uh, you're talking from the heart and that, that um, you know, you've got a message that is is hopeful and 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 terrible and you know in some respects as well but you're putting yourself out there and unfortunately there are there are, is just an element of people which is why i say i don't think it's just about jealousy or envy or whatever i think there's just some some bad vibes about me in, i don't uh, want to sort of large. sound machismoistic and macho but um i've had experience where people have said stuff about me online before and then i've talked to them face to face and they shit themselves mm. Which is generally the way it goes. Um, not yeah, going to say because, when because they because I've, they can't hide behind the keyboard. Yeah, and I've they? had it when I worked yeah. at a previous shop. I said, "All oh, right, let's have a chat then, shall we?" Oh, oh don't be like that. Don't be like that. No, let's be like that. Let's take it out in the street. Let's settle it like it was nineteen forty two. You know, let's see how it goes. And I'm not advocating violence, but there's that that disconnect socially. It's difficult to stay neutral, hmm. but it sounds like that you're you're expecting a certain level of based on experience to date. Yeah, right? a certain level of negativity Mm -hmm. so i mean with that in mind i mean what's your strategy for that i mean how are you gonna just front it out and kind of just do what you do um, don't look at certain comments if you publish something like it's the same with any sort of journalists won't look below the line with comments and it's avoidance for one and two it's try and focus on the positive changes that you are making with it or as some think about perhaps someone who's been able to express through poetry or some form of art how they're feeling as well or has the confidence to do it. And it's the same with like the spoken word nights I used to do. I like, it gave me so much fulfillment to see someone actually stand up there and share their work for the first time because they didn't know how it'd be received. And you were always very supportive, actually, I think, you know, with this, oh, the, you. With, you know, with the sort of mad as birds, mad as birds evening. Um, You know, it's creating that environment where people Mm. can get up and they can say something which, you know, sometimes can potentially offend. Yeah. But as long as it doesn't cross the line, isn't Mm -hmm. it, then it's okay. Um, But also just encouraging people to share themselves with with the wider world. And some people aren't always used to that. Mm. But I thought thought your night was great. I've got to be honest. And you always see people as well 
sort of apologizing before they do a read and say, I'm, I apologize, this is depressing, or I apologize, I'm really sorry because I'm going to bring the mood down about this. Just don't apologize if it was part of your life, it was part of you. You deserve to share it as much as anyone else does. Someone else might relate to it because life isn't just perfect. You know, you are completely human. You're just sharing your human experience. I'm just a bit sort of sad that you can't go out there and do your thing without getting shit from it, you know, when you've got enough to battle upstairs. Because, I, I mean, I suffer from anxiety and depression. I've made it blatantly obvious on the podcast, and this will probably go out. And then I'll be paranoid when I'm listening back mm. to it. Um, I'm just sad that, you know, that that's how you feel. I'm really sorry, you know. I'm I'm sorry that anybody, I, and I'm hoping that anybody who listens to it, I'm sorry that you, you feel that way, and I'm sorry that people have to... Well, it's not that. It's more just... It, it's trolls who say have no reason to do it or are doing it just to be vindictive. For example, if you get a negative review, a book review, you can sort of take that in a way because everyone's opinion everyone's opinion counts. If they don't like the book, fine. Mm. It hurts a little bit, but you just think, okay, that I can deal with that. There's That person didn't like it and they've given their reasons. It's when people call you stupid just without understanding something that's harder to deal with. And it's not something I'm looking for pity for. No, no, um, I didn't it's just, get that. No, no, um, but it's something you've just got to accept that's going to happen. You will get negativity no matter what you put out there. When did you decide to go into poetry? Um, I first got into it, I was 16. Um, I remember in school it was just taught completely Backwards. Yeah, it was. It was all I, I expected it all to be about sorry words worth, but all about like I daffodils <laughs> and, and, and rhyming and I, I couldn't I stand like that I, that I, daffodils I point. I, really I know you mean I mean. don't don't tell her, but I enjoyed I wandered lonely as a cloud. Oh there. god, I couldn't stand it. But, okay, come on then. <laughs> but then we went into um I was Seamus Heaney and it was midterm break and it was about his little brother that passed away and oh my god, it just absolutely kicked me in the guts. It, like mm. it, I was like, first start, I was like, oh my God, this poem doesn't rhyme. But then it was just the way he'd written about this little poppy bruise just on, just on his, like, just seeing it on his brother. And it was just that little symbol. I was like, oh my God, how could he contain so much emotion just in these symbolisms? And I just started like devouring poetry. And so, you were hooked. So mm. what, from the age of about 16 onwards then, is it? Yeah. And I don't know, is this a rude question to ask? How old you are now, Nat? Uh, I'm 28. 28. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So that's quite a lengthy period then of time to be writing, mm. I think. Um, I didn't start writing until I was about 18, 19, though, right, poetry. Okay. okay. It's, it, it's interesting what you were saying about that kind of early influence with kind of rhyming poetry, because my first recollections of reading poetry or being exposed to it uh, was my mum reading from, I don't know, Palgrave's Golden Treasury or something like that with the with that kind of poetry and I really liked that I liked the you know the sort of nature poems um but you do grow out of that in a sense yeah. depending on what your interests are is you know mm -hmm. uh whereas your voice now is starting to take a, a really interesting particular shape and you're expressing yourself quite honestly now I think mm. is that fair to say that, 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 yeah. that, that you've got to that it point does now? grow and it develops and like we were saying earlier about positive and negative reviews, I'm kind of grateful as well for negative or critical reviews that have made me look at things again because without that, it wouldn't have changed. I wouldn't have questioned and gone back to things or made it more authentic. I don't know whether you found that with your work as well. What specifically? Sorry. Like, um, has your Have you found that your style has changed from your first collection now? Yeah, really? well, I mean... Oh God, I mean, I was... He was moaning about it earlier. Uh, <laughs> no, honestly, uh, his book was left out. Uh, you should have seen it before you arrived. He was uh, getting really right. itchy. Yeah, this, this, is, this is true. I mean, I was talking to Alan Gibbard off mm. um, air. I think he's popped out now, isn't he? But, um, um, my, you know, my first publication, my only publication, really, independently published through Balboa Press, um, Division of Hay House, I think it is. Um, so, I mean, I push to get as much of my old stuff in that as possible yeah. and that was a massive mistake I, I i feel that was a really huge mistake but it's still a log of what you've done which is what i do like but in terms of what you're saying about how your sort of voice changes i mean the stuff that i've written now which is not in the book and a lot of people wouldn't have heard it because i haven't you know kind of uh shown it around of open mics it's completely different 
I mean, that 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 voice has changed. And I, I've noticed that there are particular phases that you go through. I don't yeah. know if you get that. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost like, a, like, you know, you get a blue period, for example, mm -hmm. for your poetry, and then it moves on to something else. Um, so do you get those segments of changes that you write prolifically around that oh, kind yeah, of totally. style, etc.? Like if I'm feeling really low, I can't write. Or if I'm feeling really happy, I can't write. But I know there's going to be a burst of creativity when I'm at the right level. And I think it's what you're saying about, like, um, you go through these stages. I think artists, just in whatever art they're in, whether that's music or poetry or visual arts, you have to, you forget sometimes that living is as much as part, a part of the creative process as the actual creating, because you need these experiences to shape what you need to channel into your writing or your your particular chosen art well i mean that really resonates with me because i'm should we say a typical piscean oh, um, Christ i know i knew he was gonna act like that but anyway the the the, the point i'm making about it is what that are you nat I, before he fucking hijacks this <laughs> i'm libra mm. oh right okay so it becomes relevant suddenly does it um well no um, actually libra and scorpio get on quite well yeah. it's just that libra's kind of take the lead from Scorpios tend to kind of dictate to right. Libra and so how things should be. So you seem to know an awful lot about uh, this sub particular subject, Mr. John. Yeah, because it uh, fascinates me. Right. And Piscians, we're very good friends, but we're no good as lovers. Yeah, well, I'm really <laughs> pleased to know that. We did try. Frankly. They wouldn't let us right. adopt, would they? They wouldn't. No. They wouldn't. But um, the beards. The beards, two beards Two together. beards. <laughs> it's, it's, not it's like two yeah. yeah, it can't possibly work. Um, and I can't remember where I was going with that now. No, you were um, saying about Pike, you was going about Pike. Oh, oh right, Pisean. okay. So, so because... I fish. Yeah, because I think I can um, be quite detached mm -hmm. in terms of um, everyday life. You know, so no, the, you're not. I'm a bit of a daydreamer, mate. It, it's a, oh, who it's, isn't? I think I've got a slight problem with it. And oh, I, I am but, but I like what you're saying now about... Um, you know, the lived experiences as important. That's what I was connecting with there. You know, so you've got to really kind of throw yourself into life. Yeah, but you two are lucky. You're real things. You know what I mean? Like scorpion, dangerous, arachnid, don't go near it. You know, bah, fish, you know. Dangerous. <laughs> well, it can be, it depends, isn't it? Um, depends on what kind of fish. Um, but two fish in the ocean, swimming about, having a laugh. I'm a kitchen scales, mate. Do you know how that makes me feel? Inadequate. <laughs> I'm an inanimate object that just sits there, and weighs things up. Meh. But people Perhaps need you. People sometimes. Need you. For ah, cooking. very good. Yeah. Oh, good save. That was a good save. Fluffing the pillow of my ego. It, it, it I'll was. Be sleeping on I that was tonight. just about to put the boot in, but uh, you saved that. But um, yeah. But why are you fascinated by all of that? If you don't mind me hijacking well, I, it. Well, I, I. Um, kind of have a general belief in all that sort of stuff. I, I think there's got a lot of relevance because it, it, it makes sense to me. All right, I've got respect for Natalie because she seems normal. Where do you sit on all of this stuff? I mean, the whole astrology, astrology and all this. I'm I mean, interested. I love, love astrology. I love okay. tarot. I'm quite spiritual. And mm. I'm No, quite, I'm not going to be disrespectful. Because We're definitely keeping that on the podcast because I'm not I need a reference out. point to come back to him to say, look, there's a normal person... Uh, who has the same beliefs as I do. Dress yeah. is better than you, mate. Well, wow. By a country mile. Yeah. Well, you haven't seen me in a dress, mate, but... I have. All right. <laughs> That's when we went for that adoption thing. That's what lost it for us. Right, okay. The beard and that bloody uh, blouse didn't work. Um, no, sorry, you were saying... So, But um, I don't have a problem with it because you make it out like I'm the ghost at the feast and Mr. Science and, you know, I throw everything out there, but... Well, I believe in all that as well. I mean, I think you can have a healthy interest in in, in all of those things, but we've talked... We, sorry. We've, we've talked, have we? Talking, we've had a little talk. Uh, we've, we've had a chat before about um, consciousness, spirituality, um, astrology, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think it overlaps. I, I, I don't think there's a difference, frankly, but we'll get into that again on, on another podcast. I want to know more about um nat as well because like we've, we've we've talked a lot about what nat's doing i want to know more about i don't know let's reverse engineer it so okay so we've spoken about how dylan thomas has had quite a bit of coverage right mm -hmm. so, okay so one of the big things with the podcast was we wanted to breathe life into the legacy of dylan via new artists um let's, let's start with you then okay okay so <laughs> Let's hit, let's hit it out the park. Let's have a couple of home runs while we're here. So go sign in. Go for it. Born and bred. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to school? I went to school 
Uh, first in Trecho in Lacha and then in Penrail in Gusainen. And you went to Gusainen College as well? I That's take right, it. yeah. Right, and... And Swan's Uni, I've travelled far. You've travelled far. Yeah. Um, and you also said that at 16, the bug bit for the uh, poetry side of things. Yeah, for reading it and then writing at 18. Have you ever gone back to anything that you've written at the age of 16, tentatively? Oh, tentatively? God, I had one published when I was... It was one of these vanity publishers, so you pay them to publish your work, basically, so they'll publish anything. Um, but I was 14, and it was it was awful. I can't I can't actually get past line two. It wasn't... It, hurt, it physically right, hurts come me on. to do read it. Do you remember it? it? No, no, do you remember it? No, it's you do, not. Come on. No, it's in my cupboard, though, and I should bring it, like to a reading one day and just just get me drunk and then ask me to read it is it about a band that you really liked at the time no no it was about a, a, it was about being heartbroken and there was a crow sitting was on, by say, a river was it about a boyfriend no because but, i didn't have a boyfriend so okay. i just like to imagine i did so okay a bit like you really <laughs> well not having a boyfriend <laughs> you'll take anyone at this moment animal mineral yeah. or vegetable pretty much pretty much no right. no 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 okay so that's really interesting okay so vanity project 14 how much of your youth influences your current work now? Are you so at, much of it. So at 28, you're able mm. to reflect on your upbringing, yeah. on your surroundings, mm -hmm. and it influences what you write. Yeah, because I think it, shape, it shapes who you are as well. And I think a lot of things... Basically, my whole next book is... It started from things that happened then, and that that's something I've carried with me since then. And I always find my head going back to the past, and I write about childhood a lot, and I write about being a teenager a lot do you ever think you could conquer it no no so it's just going to come out in writing mm. Mm. You, but then this goes back to the thing that we're saying is there a spark of hope that perhaps with the repetition and the plowing of the furrow of it over and over again will it become less um toxic and detrimental to you by sort of going through the process again and again will you almost become bored or almost um, dare I say it, immune to it I don't think I'll ever become immune to it but writing does do something I'm, I'm, I am really interested in what writing actually does as a therapy and how it changes experiences by actually getting them out if they're too difficult to speak about what happens if you actually get them on the page or if you put them into music because I mean without sort of going tangentially one of my favourite stories is Bruce Lee if he ever had a negative thought he'd actually write it down and then he'd throw it on the fire or you'd visualize writing the hurtful comment and he would mentally throw it on the fire sort of thing so it's just kind of a, trying to sort of stretch to that so taking references from your youth taking references from your culture um and now at the age of 28 bringing it to the forefront what is the next frontier for you after this book have you got anything like i said i want to do the spoken word project i keep I'm, I'm always seem to be working on a novel. There's always something in the back burner with fiction. It's just about finishing it. Okay, now do you have a novel <laughs> on the go, an idea? Yeah, I'm currently writing a comedy, which I, is totally different to what I normally do. Right. But I absolutely love doing it. As I asked Emily last week, can we talk about it? Are you not allowed to say? Cause it's I know, I can say because I don't know if I'll ever finish it. So. Well, you're happy to. Yeah, I did finish one novel. Pray continue. It's... I don't like it. I still haven't looked at it. I finished it last December and won't look at it. Well, what's it about? It was about um, it was about people from school and conversations I'd overheard because they tend to think that if you're quiet, you can't hear. But <laughs> for, for some reason, they'd speak loudly if if you were if they were on. They just tell they'd say anything, and I was just thinking, you know, I'm absorbing all this, right? Um, but I just started creating characters out of these people, and it was about. Um, them becoming young parents and just trying to grow up a lot faster than they should, which a lot of kids did in school. You were under milk wood almost in a way. Kind of, yeah. Um, but now it's totally changed. To, I think because comedy is such a release. And I do, I, I love sort of like doing one-liners on Twitter and I, I enjoy all of that stuff. I don't know how you do Twitter. I seriously <laughs> don't. The Twitter sphere is frightening. Aren't you scared by that? Yeah, it takes but a long she's a time professional poet and writer, mate. And I think you've got to engage on those platforms. I mean, but do you interact much with it? I do use it a lot because I use it a lot for work and I use it a lot for... like I've had a lot of sort of performances come in via Twitter because people will read your work on there or you'll make connections on there. So do you tweet much? I tweet a lot. How but many tweets a day? 
It depends. I did just take a two or three week break. Um, do you feel better for it? Yeah, I do. Sometimes I know when to take a break. I might take a couple of weeks off. I can't tweet because my spelling is terrible. I'm articulate, but I'm row shit. I, um, I only got into the uh, Twitter sphere uh, last year. Um, I'm not really sure how I feel about it. I it takes a long time to build up because for about, I think about four years, just I was just like, it's like shouting mm, into the void. Yeah. It really is. But That's now a beautiful it's lyric, to... man. I'm nicking that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've just written it down. Shouting well, into so. the void. That is yeah. Twitter when you start out, but then it's... Stuff to build. But the thing is, like Twitter, I, I feel like Twitter's changed because of Donald Trump. It's mm-hmm. like he just like escalated it all to such a ridiculous level. Um, that you think it's like, he'd spell check now, though? Yeah, you? You would, you? Yeah. yeah, you are. Cafefe? You must know about that, yeah. the infamous Cafefe thing. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. So, Nat, just uh, off on another little tangent. Um, you won the Terry Hetherington Award. Yeah. Um, when did you win that? Uh, so I came second in 2013 and then came first in 2015. And that, I think, out of all competitions, that's been the most important one. Because it, the judges, like Ada, who who is Terry's wife, um, she writes to everyone who you know enters, gets commended, gets published. And what she's done by creating those evenings is made links between young people who are writing. And I've built solid friendships and yeah. got involved in projects just purely off that she is a lovely woman actually she's, she's right. amazing do they still do it in neath they do uh, yeah i can't remember the name of the pub now uh, uh in the oh, it's in the little cam ah the little cam yeah, yeah that's right okay so you won that mm-hmm. um but i understand you're a little bit more involved these days with it yeah so i'm co-editing the next one um Mm. and i'm a trustee now as well just because i'm really passionate about that award Mm. and just the opportunities it brings people it's so the the prize for that then Mm. is not just a publication is it no i I think there's a financial prize as well which is quite substantial isn't it it's a thousand pound first prize and that that can make such a difference to to young writers but you know they might not have had any confidence before but that will give them an incentive to keep writing and it might give them some sort of support they need to keep on doing their yeah. craft. And that and that's another amazing competition in and around this area because mm. it's neath, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, just amazes me how many good things happen, really, to be honest. Yeah. Um, no, but it, but it is a good launch pad. And I, it, it sounds like it, it's, it's done you wonders as well in terms of giving an extra, you know, sort of leg up and, a, and mm-hmm. another thing to put on the CV. Um, cause it's obviously very well regarded, isn't it? But I mean, do you enter s- sort of competitions as a, as a matter of course, or do you tend to be a bit more, you know, kind of hold your fire a bit? I know people debate a lot about this. I'm for them, even though the entry, I do think entry fees are way too steep. And there was one that particularly angered me. It was something like 25 pound entry fee. And I just thought for a thousand pound prize, I thought there's, you can't justify that. You know, it's taken advantage. Oh, hang on, just rewind that for you just say a that 25 again? pound entry fee which i think closes off that competition to anyone who financially can't afford it so already there it's just coming from people who can afford it which just isn't fair it's not a fair ground there terry heatherington it's three pound to enter for example with a thousand pound prize on publication you know even if you just enter one poem that's a, you know, a little investment but everyone's got a chance there like if they were f- if they were funding a festival or there is some sort of event behind it, fair enough. But I cannot justify a twenty five pound entry fee. Yeah, I think twice over that. To be honest, I think it's, it's like um, pay to play. It's like what mm, we yeah. used to go through in the nineties and two thousands as musicians. You have to pay to play at a venue. Mm. You should you should enter them, um, but pick them carefully. So with that one, then is there like an age limit or anything like that, or uh, it's right as under thirty. Right, okay. So, mm. so it's exclusively for under 30s then, is it? It's or? just, yeah, it's for young writers just to yeah. start out. So if people who are listening wanted to enter that or get mm-hmm. involved in it, what's the route for that? Um, so if you look at the Cheval website, um, then you can just use the online form on there and, pay, and you can pay, pay online as well. Isn't that French for horse? It is. Ha ha! <laughs> We're back to I knew horses. That, I did know the story behind this and now I can't remember it. Um... <laughs> future what's past this next book you um, must so have an inkling I'm halfway through the collaborative project All My Dark Daughters which we performed at Swansea Fringe um, where was that at Swansea Fringe 
that was at Cinemanco. Oh, you did say it. Did we say that on air or not? I can't remember. Say it on okay, air, so no. right, let's plug that. Mm-hmm. I know it's gone, but let's yeah. talk about it. Okay. Um, so it's the first time I've done a work in progress. Um, but the other winner of the Terry Hetherington Award that was a year after me, um, Mary Alice. We noticed our styles are quite similar, and you know we should have become bitter enemies. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but we decided oh, actually it'd probably be better if we just sort of teamed up and worked together and she'd become Getting a good up on everyone else. Yeah, become a good friend mm. of mine. Why would you be bitter enemies? I'd, some some sort of you don't get so much with poetry, but with other areas you might get rivalry with people, whereas poetry is much more supportive. Mm. Um so you're not out to get each other, you're just there to support each other or you find ways of working together and I think that's lovely. Mm. But you're both published by Parthian mm-hmm. in fairness and I think yeah. I actually strolled into uh Waterstones today again mm-hmm. had n- another little look in there and um I want to know more about cinema. Let Co. me just plug the book though as well because it is worth saying yeah, that, okay. that, that if you want to if you want to get Nat's book or you want to get Mary Ellis's book they're you know widely available including in Waterstones. Right, okay, so Cinema and Co, you're on mm-hmm. it, you're kicking ass, right? Yeah. So you go up and it's this experimental thing. Carry on, I'm sorry about Iqbal, go on. Um, so it's a collaborative project where we've taken um, women from fairy tale and myth and um, folklore and we've just made their characters into something totally different. Or the characters who sort of slip by and notice, we've turned them into these really fierce women. Could you give me an example? Uh, for example, we've got Hansel and Gretel, so we tell it from the witch's point of view and the stepmother's point of view. What were they feeling at the mm. time? Um, or we take it from, like, Hera, Zeus's wife. You hear mm. about Zeus doing everything he does. What about sort of, like, the highest goddess? Why don't you hear much about her? And we've got her sort of, like, almost just taking the piss out of him when he rolls in and he's been out, like... Emasculation, almost in a way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's been out and he's... I'm happy with that because I never liked Zeus anyway. No. In fact, there's a poetry collection called Vertigo and Ghost by Fiona Benson, and she just paints Zeus um, just for what he is. He's just this sad little man, and he's got... The, it describes the rape of the swan and everything, and it's just... And put into that modern context, you just say, like, it's more shocking now, what S- he's done. As long as it's not about Odin. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, okay, so how did it go down? What was it received like, if you don't mind me asking? It was received really well, and I knew it would be because the Swansea Fringe has got that sort of supportive atmosphere there. Um, And there was a really good Q&A session at the end. Um, And I've got a lot more confidence with it now going forward. It's made me even more keen to do it. Well, you seem to have quite a glow about you, so obviously you Mm. feel really rejuvenated from the weekend and whatnot. So was it just one thing you did on the weekend at Cinema & Co, or did you sort of... It was the one event. Mari did read on the Thursday as well. Um... But no, it's just... Was that at the Brangwyn? That was at the Brangwyn, yeah. Uh, were you at the Brangwyn as well? I wasn't that night, no. Where can people... Go on, you phrase it better than me, Iqbal, come on. What? You're, you're, you you're say the educated they, man. Well, this is why I was going Here's with the Waterstone. Here's the list of things. Yeah, wa- okay, so Waterstones and internet and... Right, right. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm always dealing them. Yeah, so essentially what Simon is trying to say is <laughs> where can um, listeners mm-hmm. find your work or get in touch yeah. or kind of follow you on, on, on different platforms? Okay, uh, so... Twitter is probably the best place to connect. So that's at Miss Holborough, which is pretty easy. I'll just search for Natalie Holborough. Um, you can grab my books from when I do readings, grab it from Waterstones, order it off the Parthian website. Obviously pay, um, but, you know. Yeah, wine, yeah, no, no, wine funds, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to pay itself. And uh, website, have you said that? or have I just... uh, No, I've got a blog, which is This Girl Matters Birds mm. at wordpress.com. Uh, and when are you performing live next? So that will be at the Christine Keeler event at Elysium Gallery on the 19th of October. That's on a Saturday. I think it's, it's a seven. So we've got to get yeah. this out before then and we've got to promote it. I could promote it through the shop as well. Maybe I should start doing that. Yeah, but I feel a bit pretentious. Oh, hi, by the way. Uh, not the poetry thing, just put, uh, put in the podcast. Or I can just, if that's not doable, there's also an event on the 31st of October in Noah's Yard. Which one are you looking forward to the most, or can you not say, for legal reasons? I'm looking forward to them both. I'm quite <laughs> excited to be back reading. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is, is it literally, it's like, that's your gig. You're going up and it's you, or you got no, support? No, it's part, of a, it's part of a group. We did it last year as well. For Any... people who have nothing else to do on Halloween, we go sit around and do poetry. It's better. 
Nick, but I think you should wind it up. Well, on that note, um, <laughs> Natalie, thank you very much for joining us oh, thank uh, you. this evening. And um, I'll definitely look forward to coming down and having a look in uh, Noah's and um, uh, finding your other work online, which I haven't uh, read as yet. But um, thank you very much for coming. And in the time or tradition of the two Ronnies, it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night. <laughs>